Peter Campbell here to present and talk about an issue that's very important to me, um, and it's an issue about curve fitting. Curve fitting is a um, common pitfall of people who are developing or attempting to use systems, and what tends to happen is people will get all excited because they can get you know, the ability to apply a particular type of indicator or analytic to a market and then hit optimize and then the optimize button will turn into a nice looking curve and the result of the nice looking curve will be a potential that that curve could continue to perform that way in the future. And of course this is all based upon the primary assumption that past results are indicative of future performance. And that's the word that you see on every single website of every single investor, of every single hedge fund. Um, every document will say past performance is not indicative of the future. So here we are building models that are based totally on the past performance with no idea of how they're going to work in the future. Um, that's curve fitting. Now, how is it that you can figure out if you're curve fitting or not? One of the things that I use is something I'm going to demonstrate with you guys today is um, you would try to apply a model to a diverse group of securities. And if you weren't curve fitting, without changing a single setting in the model, you should come up with at least something reasonable as far as the results are concerned. Um, now, there's a number of different things that affect the nature of decisions made by analytics. And uh, let me describe them briefly. Um, most analytics are based on moving averages and if they're derived on moving averages then they're susceptible to um, divergence and they're susceptible to an anomal anomalies that happen when you have a very shallow movement in moving averages especially one that is parallel. Um, you know, so if you get the market moving in a a market moving in, in a very soft direction and the moving averages will be very close together, that creates a lot of confusion. Um, now, there's a lot of reasons that you can get false positives or false negatives because of these types of calculations. And divergence can create a tremendous reason for people to get a false positive or false negative. And divergence is especially apparent in markets like the ones that we have right now. We have a very shallow movement up in the market. It's very volatile, but it's choppy. And we have a megaphone pattern that keeps reproducing itself over and over. And we have one small megaphone, then we get a bigger one, then we get an even bigger megaphone, and it's just a disaster for people to trade because they, they play the breakout, the breakout fails, then it goes down and takes out the low, that low breakout fails. If you went short on the trend line break, it wouldn't work. Um, your moving averages have you selling at the bottom and buying at the top. You know, most a lot of indicators will have you doing the same thing. Um, very difficult. Um, so what what I've done here is um, to put together a little presentation, and it's not really put together. I just threw a bunch of instruments up here and I'm not even throwing them up because essentially what we have is one chart and it has a model on it. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the model. I mean uh, change the instrument and I'm not going to change the model. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with SSO for example. And I want you to look at the curve at the right. The curve at the right represents the result of the trading decisions made by the model. Now if we have robust trading decisions, then they should be able to transfer to instruments that have different price values. And one of the things that I didn't discuss, which is another reason that things could get curve fit, is that if you have a security that is trading at $800 or $1,000, and you calibrate all of your analytics to work with that security, you may be, without knowing it, calibrating it to that price range as well. So, you know, a certain analytics will not produce the same triggers, the same results with a security that's $5 as it would with something that's 1000 So you have all this drift. So if you have a company like AIG, which was 120 and it goes down to 5 a particular model is going to stop working you know, very easily 
you know, in that progression and stay not working, you know, at, at, for a long period of time. And it's not going to be based upon, you know, the, the obvious reasons. And one of, the, one of the reasons may be that the actual analytics used in the calculations for the decisions are going to drift and change uh, as the prices go lower. And, and so the best example I could give you of that, just to conceptualize it, is that if I have a security, it's $1,000 per contract or share, and then I get a trigger for a buy on it, um, whatever the price pattern was. Uh, if I was to take that same security and divide it by 10, that would be equal to 100. And I could apply another analytic to that and not get a signal. That is very common. You know, there's certain analytics that would be able to be applied that would be the same, but there's many that are not. And so there, these are you know, vulnerabilities that you have when you're making um, models. You have to know about that stuff. Um, so anyway, I'm going to close this um, presentation up pretty quickly because what I'm going to do is go through a bunch of correlated and non-correlated instruments here. We went from QID to SSO. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go to DIA. Um, and um, you'll see the curve generated at the right of the trading decisions. I'm going to go to uh, SRS. This is absolutely not correlated to anything that you're that you're seeing. Ugh. Apparently, I can't type. Uh, so this is not correlated to indexes which have been going up, and it's not necessarily correlated even to indexes that were going down. Um, then. We have FAS. XLF. Um, so what I've done here is I've shown, and let me see, maybe I'll do, let's see, IWM. Do I have that one? And IWM. So what I've done here is I've shown you a bunch of different securities different prices, different volatilities, different correlations, and one model that is trading these things with no stops. There's, I mean, uh, of course, when you run a model, you're going to put stops in. However, in this case, there is no stop. And the result is what you saw. And an example of the way to test and, ass and to assume that you're in a, you're trading analytics that are not going to be compromised by drift or by assessments of what the past did and what the future will do is to actually take a model and apply it to many different securities which will which will which can create a um, a reasonable picture of the randomness that will happen in the future in which case the past results are not similar to the future and if the past is not similar to the future or the future will not be what you expect when you looked at the past, then at least you can make a reasonable assessment that the model you're using has the capability to address changes in volatility, changes in price, changes in momentum, changes in trading style, environment, etc., and adapt to them. And that's the basis of the RVS systems, the relative value systems, is that they are self-adaptive in that they, that they automatically, without changing any values, will attempt to value themselves and manage themselves with some sort of um, uh, reference to the markets that they're trading rather than trying to correlate them to the fat past. Thank you. Good night.